And we, we will be talking about why Jesus became a man. What is the purpose for the incarnation? It's a big question. There's a lot that could be said, and we could say more than we are going to say. Uh, but we're going to say some of the things that the text very clearly does say. Uh, we're going to talk about those a little bit. Uh, we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at verses uh, five through eighteen. Uh, but we're going to start reading at verse one, just to get a little bit of context there. So, if you would read with me. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking it has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let's pray as, as we begin. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for what this teaches us about you, teaches, teaches us about ourselves. Father, would you open up all of our hearts this morning to be uh, changed and to be molded by these truths and to be encouraged uh, and to be, to be shaped. Father, we, uh, we put ourselves in front of your word and we ask that you would change us. Amen. So this is the question we're asking. Why did Jesus become a man? And I just want to jump in to the text um, and think about it. So in verse 5, the author notes that God did not subject the world to come to angels. And saying this, uh, he hints that he's about to reveal to whom God did subject the world to come. And surprisingly, we read in verses 6 to 8, uh, if you look right there, that God subjected the world to man. He quotes Psalm 8, writing this, You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and putting everything in subjection under his feet. And th this is bewildering, that God would make man the ruler of creation. Man is so, so small and undeserving. And the psalmist picks up on this when he writes just, just before he, what we just read. He says, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? What a statement about the dignity that God has created us with. As human beings made in the image of God, we were made to subdue and have dominion over creation. We were made to be crowned with glory and honor and have creation subjected to us. Isn't that what God commanded Adam in Genesis 1.28? He said, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. But this isn't the reality for humanity that we see, is it? And the author affirms this in verse 8 when he says, At present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. 
The sinful desires of humanity have corrupted our relationship to God as image bearers and our rule over creation is compromised. As humans, we are not naturally crowned with glory and honor. So this reality is not true and cannot be true for the natural human. But this is where we see Christ enter into, enter into our hopelessness. And he, sit, he says this in verse 9. He recognizes that we cannot see this reality in mankind, but we do see the man who has fulfilled this reality. Look, look at verse 9 with me. Even though we don't see creation subjected to all mankind, we do see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. He's the God-man, Jesus Christ, who was in the beginning and was with God and was God, but he took on flesh and dwelt among us. So, so this first purpose, um, I don't know where the marker went, it's in my pocket. Cool. Why did Jesus become a man? And that was uh, to fulfill the created purpose of man. I'm going to write all this out, so just hold on. We see that in verses 5 through 9. So he's the God-man, Jesus Christ. He, he was with God in the beginning. He was in the beginning, and he was God, and he took on flesh, and he dwelt among us. And when, when he took on flesh, he took on the entirety of what it means to be human. He was vulnerable. vulnerable. He was genuinely tempted to sin against his father, but he remained without sin. He experienced hunger. He hurt and probably screamed when he missed nails and smashed his fingers. Uh, by coming in the flesh, he made, he was made for a little while lower than the angels. And because of his suffering and death, he was crowned with glory and honor. We might ask, why, why would Jesus be rewarded for dying? But this becomes clear when we look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. You don't have to turn there. It says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the Father did not exalt Jesus simply because he died. All men die. Death would not have made Jesus special. It did not make him special, but Jesus was obedient to the point of death. That is what made Jesus different from all of us. We are not obedient at all, nor are we obedient to the point of death. Jesus was obedient in suffering and hu humiliation, even to the point of death. So as a result of this, as a result of his obedience and suffering and death, uh, Jesus was crowned with glory and honor. And he fulfilled, that, doing that, he fulfilled that quotation from Psalm 8, that, that Hebrews uh, quotes right there. Uh, so Christ became a real flesh and blood man, and he obediently endured suffering and shameful death, not just death, but shameful death. Uh, because of his, and because of his obedience to the end, God crowned him with glory and honor, which includes the, subjections of all, the subjection of all things in creation to him. So in doing all this, he proved himself to be the man in the sense that he fulfilled the designed purpose of what man was created to be. And someone, someone may say, well, if, if Jesus died to glorify himself and, and bring all of creation under his own authority, and he did, right? He brought all of creation under his own authority. He did that, and it changed who he was. He knew that was going to change uh, his relation to authority as, as a man. And we, we, someone may ask, isn't that selfish? Was Jesus being selfish? Because he knew that from the beginning, that that's what he would do, that um, he would bring all of creation under his own authority, uh, was, was he being self-serving in his obedience to the Father? The two answers to this objection immediately present themselves. First, um, Jesus was being obedient to the Father. And if he, he was serving the Father, then that automatically negates any idea that we could say he was being selfish. Or at least completely selfish, right? All right and, and then the second thing is, in the last part of verse 9, read that with me. It offers a precursor for the next three purposes for why Jesus became a man. It says, We see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death 
for everyone. His work was not for himself. It's true that he became the ultimate authority in the created world, but all of his work was so that he would taste death on behalf of others. His work was outward focused. It was focused toward us, those in this room. And, that, and that's what the next three points, there are four points that we're looking at this morning. That's what the next three points reflect, is that this was not merely for, for, to change the position of Christ as one who um, had all authority subjected to him as fulfilling this created purpose. So the second, uh, the second purpose we see for Jesus becoming a man uh, was so that he would bring uh, many sons to glory. You see that in verses 10 to 13. So let's, let's read verse 10 together again. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. There are three crucial realities in this verse that, that we need to point out. First, the one for whom and by, by whom all things exist refers to the Father. And the Father, uh, as the Creator, has absolute authority over what He has created. Second, Jesus suffered with the purpose of bringing many sons to glory. And then third, Jesus was perfected through His suffering. The general description of all these coming together is in the very first phrase of the verse. It says, it was fitting. This phrase causes the chief tension in the text. And how on earth is this fitting? How on earth could it be fitting for Jesus, the righteous one who did not know sin? How could it be fitting for Him to suffer? And on that, to be perfected through suffering. What does that mean? We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Now, how can it be fitting for men who have done nothing deserving of honor to receive the grace of sonship? How could that be fitting? And the answer is simple and beautiful and profound. It has numerous implications that we'll, we'll talk about, and some, I think, fit into this list. But simply, it is because the Father desired it. The Father desires it. Remember that first reality in verse 10 where he said that the Father has absolute authority over what he has created for himself. And he desires that many sons would be brought to glory. And his love for these adopted sons demands or demanded that his only begotten son would be made perfect through suffering. Thus it is fitting Remember John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him would have everlasting life, that they would not perish, right? Many sons being brought to glory because God loves us. He loves the sons. Another question is blaring here. What does it mean for Christ to be made perfect through suffering? Uh, we will talk about this very quickly, but... Uh, the word perfect does not only relate to moral perfection. It's usually when we talk about somebody being perfect, it doesn't just relate to moral perfections. Uh, in, in Hebrew specifically, it talks about completeness. Uh, this, it's a completion. Uh, and for Christ, He was, um, he was per not perfected through suffering in the sense that the suffering atoned for His own sin, which He did not have any, or, or that it made Him a more perfect being, but that He was he was already morally perfect, but his suffering and death perfected him. It completed him in the sense that it completed his humanity. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, if you just turned over one, one or two pages, it says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what, the father, or through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So he learned obedience through suffering, and this resulted in him being made perfect and becoming the source of of salvation. So even though he learned obedience, Jesus, Jesus knew what he was getting into. He didn't get to the cross and think, oh, I didn't think it would go this far. He knew what he was getting into. It's more like a man who, who's asked to speak at an event where there are thousands of people. He knew what he was supposed to talk about, but he doesn't recognize the full weight of what he is doing until he gets onto the stage and he begins to speak. He doesn't he has not felt the weight of the burden of speaking until he's standing in front of the people speaking. So, Christ's humanity was completed by his suffering. And all this was for the sake of the sons 
who would be brought to glory. And why would Jesus waste his time on people? Okay, so God loves the sons. All right, why would Jesus, the son, waste his time on people who are not yet obedient to God and have no understanding or desire to love God? This is the point that the author of Hebrews spends verses 11 to 13 fleshing out. And the explanation he gives is that these are not people who are random and disconnected from Jesus. In fact, it calls them, in verse 11, those who are sanctified and says that they and Jesus have the same source. And that source is none other than God himself. They are adopted sons of God and therefore brothers with Christ. And for this reason, Jesus unashamedly calls them brothers. Look in in verse 12 with me, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. So when Jesus suffered for the purpose of bringing many sons to glory, he not only gave himself out of obedience to the Father, he was acting out of obedience to the Father, but he was acting out of love for his brothers. And we've been talking about the third, third person brothers in this. But, but we, we church, are the brothers and sisters for whom Christ died. In a very real way, Christ did not merely suffer, suffer for you out of obligation to the Father. He suffered for you because he deeply and movingly loved you, and he still loves you. And that dramatic and overpowering and self-sacrificing love he had for you at the cross still remains today. Like like in the parable of the sower, think about the the weeds uh, and and the anxieties and the worries that, that creep up and seek to squeeze faith out of us, squeeze love out of us, keep us away from that persevering faith. I exhort you, in light of those anxieties and worries, the worry that does God love me? Could he love me when, when this has happened, when this loved one has died? How could God be good? How could God love me in this? God's love for you was great at the, at the cross. Christ's love for you was great at the cross. And there's no greater remedy for that doubt than meditation on the cross. He gave himself He gave himself to bring you glory. And the third truth uh, is that Jesus became a man to free us from the fear of death. Let's see that in verses 14 and 15. He freed us from the fear of death by nullifying its power. He says that he destroyed the one who has the power of death. And he did that through death. So verses 14 and 15 come together to reveal two powerful truths about the death of Christ. First, in the second half of verse 14, we find that the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, was made powerless by Jesus' death. Second, through his death, Jesus delivered All those who through fear of death, that's us, were subject to lifelong slavery. Note that he has not freed us from death, but from the fear of death. I'm sure we're all familiar with the saying, if not the truth, that 10 out of 10 people die. And unless Jesus returns, rest assured that in 90 days, everybody in this room, look across the room if you want, look and see how many young people there are. Everybody in this room will have faced death, stare death in the face, or at least come very close to it. In our natural state, we have a fearful dread of death. And as those who were formerly under God's wrath, that was not misplaced. We should be scared of death if we are not under the righteousness of Christ. If we've not been forgiven by Christ, we should fear death. We fear our own death. We fear the death of loved ones. We even fear for the death of strangers. And in this particularly health-conscious and germophobic age, we prove this concept more than ever as we run on treadmills and squirt germ-killing chemicals in our hands and, and go and shop at the organic aisle at the grocery store. We search for ways to put off the inevitable encounter with death. But this passage reminds us, reminds us, all who believe, all who believe in Christ for salvation, it reminds us of the invigorating truth that death holds no power over us. Yes, we will die, but death will 
bow the knee to Christ. And when that happens, we will be resurrected. When, when the consummation of the kingdom comes, we will be resurrected with glorified bodies in the new heavens and the new earth, or there will be no more death. We are free from the terror and mystery that death once held over our head as it taunted us with our own fear. We are free from that fear. And we now look ahead to a life that is unending and spent completely free from any thought of death. And that, and that this is our sure hope right now. This is our sure hope. We no longer have to fear death now when we look ahead to a life that we will have where we will have no thought of death. Death will, not, will no longer be a reality. Without the work of Christ freeing us from the fear of death, we would have no hope. It would be impossible for us to say we have no fear of death. So, so the, fourth, the fourth truth, why did Jesus come? He came to be a merciful and faithful high priest. See that in verses 16 to 18. Verse 16 uh, introduces this thought, uh, and, and it tempts me to make another item for the list, uh, and that says something like, the Son of God became a man because God did not enact salvation for angels. He did it for men. He would have become an angel if he wanted to do it for angels. He did not, though. And that's another thing we could add to the list. We won't. Um, you can add it to yours. Uh, uh, the author is using this clear statement uh, that God was working for the salvation of men, not angels. And specifically, He was working for the salvation of those who would have faith in His Son. That is, the, the spiritual offspring of Abraham, those who have faith. And they, not angels, are the recipients of the Lord's help. And th this affirmation is why the author writes in verse 17 that, that quote, he, he had to be made like His brothers in every respect. That's why He became a man. And He goes on to make this, li this last point very clear. He, he writes this exactly and adds more. Um, he says that he became a merciful, or that he did it to become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Christ's high priestly sacrifice on the cross turned away God's wrath. It, it was propitiated our sins. I turned away God's wrath and made it true that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But his work, his work didn't stop at the cross. As long as we live in these bodies beset with weaknesses, our Savior is a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in every way just as we are. He sympathizes with our weaknesses because he understands them. Yet, he was without sin. He understands how bad it hurts to lose a loved one. He knows what it's like to experience degradation from those he loved and respected. He knows what it is to be tempted and to suffer in every way that we do. Every single way that you can imagine, every way that you're suffering or are tempted by sin right now, he knows. He understands. And he had victory over all of it. And by faith, we're united with him. And we, too, have victory over those things. We're united with Christ and we have victory over our sins. And this, this passage makes clear that we live in an already but not yet season that awaits the consummation of the kingdom of God. We currently share in victory and rule with Christ. But as this passage made clear, we don't yet see the subjection of all things to Christ. Even though it is a present reality, we don't see the completeness of that. Even though death no longer stings for us, we will still experience a physical death. Although we have received the down payment of the Holy Spirit, we do not yet live in the thick, intangible presence of God that's promised to us in the new heavens and new earth, in the new Jerusalem. Our inner selves have been renewed and are being renewed by the Holy Spirit, but we have not yet received the glorified and eternal exteriors, bodies, that we've been promised we live in an inaugurated kingdom, but it's not yet consummated. And that's what we look, we look ahead to that. And we see that reality in all of these. Uh, and as we finish up the, these four points, let's take a step back. Uh, and I want us to ask, what do we assume 
in all of these points. For, for these to be true, what is it that we assume? What reality is embedded and required in all of these realities? It's not mentioned. We didn't talk about it that I, that I can remember a whole lot if we did. Uh, it's the resurrection. The resurrection is required for any of these truths to have effect. These are all present realities that Christ has uh, fulfilled the created purpose of man. He is the God-man currently. He has all creation subjected to him. He uh, has brought and is bringing many sons to glory. He has freed us from the fear of death. Presently, we are free of that fear. And he is presently a merciful and faithful high priest. The resurrection is required for any of these to make sense. All right, so if he rules over creation, having fulfilled the purpose, the created purpose of man, he has to be alive. If he was not resurrected, he would not be ruling. He wouldn't reign. He couldn't. Because he would be dead if he was not resurrected. To bring many sons to glory, this bring here in the text also means lead. He's leading, bringing. He's there bringing them to glory, to the glory that he is currently in. He's bringing us along to that glory. How could he bring us to that glory if he were dead? How could he lead us? How can you follow a dead man to a destination other than death? He's leading us to glory because he's alive. And it's required. We have to say he is alive. If he's not alive, we are not being led to glory. We're being led to something else. He's freed us from the fear of death. If Christ died and remained dead, how could we be free of the fear of death? Because the person that we are following to glory, if he is dead, we too will see death and we are not freed from that fear. We are still under the wrath of God, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ also died to be a merciful and faithful high priest, but he lives as that merciful and faithful high priest. How could he make propitiation for us? How could he intercede for us eternally to the Father? If he were dead. He's resurrected. He's alive. As we, as we approach Easter weekend next week, right, we would do well to dwell on the necessity of resurrection, not only for these truths, but as we think about our faith and think about everything that we believe, the resurrection is absolutely necess- necessary. Uh, dwell on these things. Uh, so as, as we close, I, I want to just recap some truths that we've mentioned here. Uh, that If you're a believer, you must absolutely cling to uh, in order to continue in joyful faithfulness. So first, uh, a key word, reigning. Uh, even though the world seems uncontrollable and possibly outside of God's will, know that Christ is reigning even now and that one day that will be clear to us. And the second uh, the key word, high priest, Christ was a human being who had to struggle with temptation. He struggled with temptation. He was vulnerable because he was a man and men are vulnerable. He, he sympathizes with your weaknesses and insecurities and struggles. Uh, let me exhort you to take those things to him uh, and, and claim that victory over them that he has given. The third key word, family. The father and son both desire you. Christ died because he loved you. God loved you, so he sent Christ to die. The father wanted reconciliation with you desperately enough to send his own son. And thus, you are, you are a sibling. You are brother or sister of Christ this morning. And Christ unashamedly call you, calls you brother. He unashamedly calls you that, as the text says. So as we look at each other, again, just if we look around the room right now, these are brothers and sisters in Christ. Unashamedly call them brother. We don't call them brother or sister because we like them, even though we do. I want you to like them. We call them brother and sister because they are brothers and sisters through Christ. We're family in the truest sense with God as our father and Christ as our elder brother. We are all brothers and sisters. Treat them as a brother and sister. I know you get in fights with your brothers and sisters, but love them. Have that brotherly love. Have the same love for each other that Christ has had for us, unashamedly calling us brother and even dying for us because he loved us. Another takeaway, key word, life. 
Death's power over you has been nullified. You may grow weak. And you may die physically. But these are only milestones. They're milestones marking how much closer you are to being raised with Christ. So take joy in that this morning. As you approach death from the day you were born, you have been approaching death. It's always sobering to think about. As you approach death, look at it, instead, not with fear, instead with joy, knowing that you are getting closer to the resurrection when you will have a body that you will not have to think about death. No longer are you decaying or, be, or being degraded. You're being raised with Christ. So let's pray. Father, thank you for these truths. Thank you, Father, for sending the Son to die for us, to free us from the fear of death, uh, to, be, to be a high priest for us, to, to cause forgiveness for our sins, to bring, bring all of us to the glory that you've created us for. Father, thank you for that fulfillment. We praise you this morning because of your love for us. You've loved us first. Uh, and we pray that we would, you would empower us to love you as we should, and to love each other as is fitting. Father, teach us to love, teach us to rest in, in our hope. Teach us to rest in, in the family that is here that, that you have made possible and created. We thank you for all these things and we rejoice in them together. Amen.